<laughs> I said, I've known Richard for a long time. I worked with him uh, at the university here as he was pursuing his PhD in instructional psychology and technology. Uh, the one thing that he's had lots of experience with designing uh, programs, curriculum, uh, using media, all kinds of things. And works in the faculty, works in the Center for Teaching and Learning right now as the associate director, where I was the director a few years ago. And so I've had lots of contact, oftentimes daily, uh, with Richard. Let me just tell you what I respect a lot about Richard. He is a thinker. Richard thinks through things. Uh, watching him complete his dissertation was a privilege for me because of the care and the work and the focus that he had to help improve learning. If you look at what the Center for Teaching and Learning really does, <clears throat> it's trying to help student learning get better by helping teachers teach better. And so Richard could not be better placed than he is in that center to do that. So without taking any more time, I just want to say how valuable I feel uh, our relationship is with Richard and our privilege has been to work with him for we've been for seven years in the center and a good part of that time his dissertation and uh, you're in for a treat. He will, he will help you think of something you haven't thought of before, I guarantee it. <laughs> Okay, well, if you don't mind, I'm going to uh, use this mic because, I don't know, ADD, something, you know, before they were diagnosed that I just can't stand behind it. Stand still, right? So, um, we are going to talk today about agency as the foundation of teaching and learning. Now, my work in the, the uh, Center for Teaching and Learning, we help faculty who have had very little instruction, many of them, in teaching. And so one of the things we do is we teach them course design, which many of them haven't ever done before, right? So that's partly why the reason for the title of our topic, we put on a workshop, a day and a half long workshop for new faculty to, to teach some of these principles. And so this is uh, a snippet of what the workshop would be and kind of the well, I would say the most important part, but maybe I'm a little biased, too. Okay, so, one of the things I'd like you to do, first of all, because you're gonna be doing something in this session, you're gonna be doing a couple things. If you are an educator, a formal educator, um, pick a class, a topic, a course that you teach that you want to do something with, Maybe you want to improve in some way. Okay, and get that in your mind because we're going to have you use that eventually toward the end of this session. Okay? Even if it's gospel doctrine or laurels or whatever it might happen to be, something you teach or expect to teach, and get keep that in mind. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to ask, we're going to start with some basic questions. What is the purpose of teaching? Now probably the most common answer I've heard around is go something like this, that the purpose of teaching is to accurately transmit the knowledge of the discipline. So if I give it to you accurately and you tell it back to me accurately, then you have learned and I have taught. Okay? Another answer, this answer actually comes from the 1860s. It was one of the arguments in favor of state-funded public education to indoctrinate the youth in sound knowledge and moral virtues. Sounds like a religious thing, but actually it comes from a more secular venue. Now I would say that both of these things actually <coughs> are not that good because they overlook the learner. They overlook the learner and their role in this process. 
So I'm going to give you a simpler and more basic idea here that the purpose of teaching, quite simply, is to catalyze learning. Okay, and I use the word catalyze purposefully. Now I'm only going to be a part of this, but a catalyst, what a catalyst does in chemical terms is it lowers the activation energy of a, rea of a reaction. So our world stays stable because of activation energy. This barrier, if it weren't for having to overcome activation energy, all our chemicals would be reacting all over the place and we would not have a stable world. We wouldn't have a stable chair to sit on. So in order for a chemical change to happen, we've got to, we've got to get over that barrier of activation energy. And what a catalyst does is it lowers activation energy, the amount of energy required for the reaction to happen. So by way of analogy, what good teachers do, what the best teachers do, is they lower the activation energy of students so that they know <coughs> are reacting, if you will, interacting with their own time, their own effort, their own energy. They are acting instead of being acted upon. And I have created an environment where it is easier or safer for them to act and to learn. And I would guess that nobody has probably said this, I've never heard it at least, but what I would say is this is actually your primary job as a teacher. It's not to know the content, although you need to know that. Your primary job actually is to lower activation energy and get students engaged. So if our purpose is to catalyze learning, then what is the purpose of learning? Well, my informal surveys, at about 75% of students would say that the purpose of learning or the purpose of education is to get a good job. That, by the way, is students at BYU. Okay? So it's not just out in the world. Um, but that's what they've been told for 12 years, at least, of their education. Why do you get an education? To get a good job. So it's no surprise that they think that. The next answer, you know, I get this a little bit too, to become a well-rounded person. Well, I would like to propose and ask you to consider a more fundamental proposition, that the purpose of learning is to expand agency. Okay, so if I learn a new language, suddenly I can talk to people I couldn't talk to before, I can think things I couldn't think before. I can go places I probably wouldn't have gone before because I've learned something. <coughs> and so now my agency is expanded. Okay. So that's going to lead us then to this examination of what is agency. Now we're used to thinking of agency, the most common way we talk about it in the church is agency is choice. And certainly choice is a part of agency, but I would like to submit to you that choice is only a part, and agency is much greater than choice. Choice exists in the moment, moment to moment, moment to moment. And on what basis do we evaluate any choice if choice is synonymous with agency. We have problems if choice is synonymous with agency. So I'd like to, we're going to explore this a little bit together. The dictionary definition, by the way, is agency is the power to act, which is consistent with our doctrine as well. Lehi talks about things to act, things to be acted upon. And I put in parentheses independently because that notion is important even though it's not always found in the dictionary. So let's look at agency in terms of cause and effect. We'll look at it in a little bit different way. So cause and effect. Here's a classic example of cause and effect. The cue stick hits the cue ball, which causes it to roll forward and hit the blue ball, causing it to roll forward, and hopefully 
to go in the corner pocket, right? But what causes the cue stick to hit the cue ball? A human being. And what causes the human being to use the cue stick? A human being. The human being, right? The same one holding the cue stick is the one who's causing it to move forward. So actually, as agents, we are a cause. We cause things to happen. We are also an effect because we affect ourselves and the world around us, right? But we, our, our actions affect ourselves. So we are cause and effect. So with that idea then, we can see these components of agency in this example. First of all, there's a purpose, an action, and an outcome. So with a purpose, what am I trying to accomplish? I'm actually not just trying to use the cue stick. I'm actually trying to do something steps away from the cue stick. I'm trying to get that blue ball in the corner pocket. And I'm probably not actually just trying to get the blue ball in the corner pocket. I'm trying to win the whole game, right? Which is many, many more steps down the road. So I'm choosing something now because I have a purpose in mind. I'm trying to accomplish something. Okay? But I also have to perform the appropriate action. I have to use the cue stick just right to hit the cue ball in just the right place with just the right speed so that the chain reaction happens the way it's supposed to happen. So my action has to be appropriate as well. And then I look at the outcome, right? Did the blue ball go in the corner pocket or not? And then if it didn't, I have some things to learn or some things to adjust. Right. But that's part of my agency is I'm trying to achieve an outcome. Did I achieve it or did I not? So we're gonna look at some of these components in a little more detail. Agency is purposeful. Agents seek to create or to influence their future. So we're, we're really not just interested in moment by moment by moment by moment choosing ad infinitum. That's really not our nature. Our nature actually is and should be looking to the future. Now, what future we choose makes a big difference. And the per perspective we have on what the future holds for us or what, possi what possible futures are present is very important. So we learn in order to gain a broader perspective about possible consequences and better futures. When we act, we're trying to bring about a better future. And this, by the way, for me, is faith. We're acting in faith. Faith is the power of agents because we do not know the outcome until we engage in the action and see whether the outcome happens or not. And as we get more success in terms of creating that outcome, we get more evidence to substantiate our faith. And so we're more willing to persist and to carry through. Agency is capable. We have to be able to perform the action necessary to bring about the future that we want, right? So as I was saying in our example with the cue stick, I have to be able to use that in just the right way to get the blue ball in the corner pocket. Okay, so we learn in order to expand our capability. Agency is lawful. 
So in order to be effective and sustainable, sustainable agency must be lawful, okay? And it's lawful in two dimensions, a physical dimension and a moral dimension. So in the physical dimension, in order for me to get that blue ball in the corner pocket, I have to have some understanding of how those balls are going to behave physically. Now, I might not have to calculate the Newtonian equations. That might not be the level of understanding that I need. But I need to know their lawful behavior and how to influence that lawful behavior in order to bring about the outcome I want. If I don't understand that lawful behavior, then chances are I'm not going to achieve my outcome. So I have to act lawfully in a physical sense, or I won't be effective. So as physical beings in a physical world, we are subject to physical laws. Okay. The moral dimension. Now it turns out that as agents, we are not alone. We live in a community of other agents. Oops. There we go. And their agency is just as sacred to them as ours is to us, right? And so we have to act that this is the whole purpose, I think, behind the things we're trying to learn here in this mortal life is to learn to act in such a way that our agency is not violated, but we do not violate the agency of others as well. And that brings us a moral dimension. That we need to act in such a way that we do not violate their agency. Now, another thing we need to look at here too is we tend to think of agency as being in the individual. But actually, groups are agents as well. Okay, so we think about the team. The team is working together to accomplish a common goal. They're doing all the things that agents do. A church, family, a corporation. In fact, the legal doctrine of a corporation is that it is legally a person. And so it's treated as a person in the eyes of the law, even though it's a group. So we also need to think about that we live within groups as well too, and those groups have agency, and they deserve them the same respect, right, and deference uh, that an individual agent would as well too. There's another component to agency as well, that agents can be empowered to act on another's behalf. So we have real estate agents, we have lawyers, we have sports agents, we have all kinds of agents, and what do they do? They work on somebody else's behalf to do the things that maybe they can't do for themselves. Parents are a good example of this as well. Because a little baby can do hardly anything for itself. So the parents act as agents on its behalf to do the things it can't do, meanwhile trying to expand and increase that baby's agency as it grows up. Okay. So, as agents within a community of agents, we subject ourselves to social conventions and political and moral laws. This list, this is one of those lists that could go on forever. I just tried to keep it short. So the net, oh, so, now if you're like me, this is me, right, thinking, wait a minute, I see all kinds of people going around doing stuff that's, that I would consider unlawful, right, immoral, and they seem to be getting away with it. What's up with that? If this is true, then how is it that unlawful behavior um, seems to happen? So here's my answer to that that we can misuse our agency in ways um, that negates our own or others' agency. But actually that the natural consequence of that mis misuse of agency will be a loss of agency. 
So I had some uncles who thought that they could use a sheet for a parachute, and they jumped off their two-story house. And lo and behold, the laws of physics did not work with that sheet, and they got injured, right? And so in a physical way, their agency is diminished, at least temporarily. Okay, fortunately, they healed. But in a moral sense, that happens as well, too, um, that our unlawful behavior will eventually result in a loss of agency. So if I steal and I get caught, I'm going to be sent to prison, and my agency is now diminished. And since this is English and we can invent words in English, I'm going to invent a word and say that this kind of behavior is not agency. It is actually anti-agency because we are using our power in this, these unlawful ways to diminish agency, to work against agency, actually. And eventually we will be, no longer be able to use that power in that way. Okay. So to be sustainable and effective, agency must be lawful. So we learn in order to understand and act within the physical and moral laws by which we are governed and by which we govern ourselves. So self-discipline is an integral part of agency. No one should ever be able to say to you anymore, I am an agent, I can do whatever I want. Because that is not what agency really means. Agency is responsible. If I'm a cause, then I'm the one who set in motion that chain of events. So I am responsible for the effects of initiating that chain of events. Okay? And we look at responsibility on these same three dimensions. That we judge responsibility based on your purpose. What was your intent? So if a little baby pulls my hair, it still hurts. But I judge that action differently than if a teenager pulls my hair because I assume a different purpose. And I'm probably correct in that assumption. I might not be, but probably. Right. Um, and then we also judge it in terms of the action. Was this the action that was necessary to bring about the outcome, or would another action have been better? Or could you refine that action to be a little better? So we judge it based on action. And then we also judge it based on the outcome. Was our purpose actually achieved or not? And if it wasn't achieved, actually what we think then often is now we have an opportunity to learn because now I can learn what I need to do in order to bring about that outcome. So Shank and others, Kelly is another one, talks, Shank in particular talks about expectation failure. That when what we expect to happen doesn't happen, that now opens us up to learning. And so one of the things that Shank does is he causes an expectation failure. He sets up a place where something is going to fail so that students are now open, willing, and ready to find out what the answer is. Um, we had, uh, so one of the faculty I worked with was teaching engineering, st statistics for engineers. And he said, the engineers just hated statistics. They wanted to go build bridges. What, what do I need to learn statistics for? So the very first activity he did, he, he built a little simulation, a computer simulation. He said, okay, I want you to optimize the output of this system. And you can tinker with all these settings and see if you can optimize the output. He also said engineering students just love to tinker, right? So they're oh, really going at it, trying to, you know, going at it, and they can't do it. 
or they don't know if they did or not. And he said, if I can show you a way to optimize this output in eight steps, would you do it? What do you think the answer is? Well, of course, yeah, absolutely. Okay, statistics can help you optimize this output in eight steps. So suddenly he has them hooked, right? That now statistics mean something in terms of the outcomes they're interested in. Okay. So we learn in order to better align purpose, action, and outcome with physical, social, and moral law. So, what I'd like to propose here is a different definition of agency, actually, that is not found in the dictionary. That is more consistent, certainly, with our doctrine. And I kept this in academic language, but you could easily convert that to a fairly familiar gospel phrase. Agency is the power to bring about lawful, or you can insert righteous, purposes. As an individual, as a group, and on behalf of another. So as teachers, we are agents in all of these ways, all at the same time. And we are an agent on behalf of <coughs> several interested parties. We're an agent on behalf of the school district or the institution. We're an agent on behalf of parents. We're actually also an agent on behalf of students as well too, and oftentimes they tend to get overlooked because they come and go so quickly. But we need to keep that in mind. Okay. So if we come back to learning, and we say the purpose of learning is to expand agency, then the purpose of learning is to expand our power to bring about lawful or righteous purposes. And anything else would be in service of anti-agency, which is a different thing. So let's ask the question, what is learning? So one common answer that kind of goes with our purpose of teaching is learning is the acquisition of knowledge. If I put stuff in my brain and I can tell it back to you, then I have learned. Uh, and that's fairly common. Now, the, the definition from my field, the classical definition, is learning is a relatively stable change in behavior because we're looking at external observable things and the only thing we can observe is behavior. But that tells us nothing about the heart. So I'm going to propose to you another proposition to think about that learning is a transformation of the learner into a new person. If I have learned something, I am no longer the same person I was before. I can do things I couldn't do before. I see the world in ways I didn't see the world before. I see myself in ways that I didn't see myself before. I'm not actually the same person that I was for good or for ill. Okay. So we have to acknowledge in the world we live in that this transformation can be positive or negative. It can go either direction. And it can be profound or shallow. So our hope is to make a positive and profound transformation of the learner and I'm going to revise our purpose of teaching and expand that a little bit, that our purpose is to catalyze a profound and positive transformation of the learner into a wiser, more capable, more moral agent. Warren Tag, in their article in their book in 2000, um, make the point that education, especially formal education, has mistaken the means for the ends. 
that we look at our subject matter as the end. Now, I hope everybody has something to write with. Because we're going to put you to work. And I'd like you to write for five minutes on this question. How has your discipline expanded your agency? How has it made you a better person? How has it made you wiser, more capable, more moral? Any of those dimensions that apply to agency. So if you would take five minutes, and here's the thing, so here's the writing exercise. Um, I need to preface it a little bit. Okay, you need to just keep writing. Whatever comes to your mind, just write. Don't worry about punctuation, grammar, spelling, any of that kind of stuff. That's for another day, another time. Okay? <coughs> just let the thoughts come into your head and write. And just keep writing. Yeah. By discipline, are you talking about self-discipline or, or academic discipline? Well, I'm, I'm kind of assuming, and maybe it's a, not a very good assumption, that most of you have an academic discipline. I'm thinking, I, I want you to think about that, that thing you devoted several years of your life to and think of it in terms of your own agency or something similar if that applies to you. And we'll go for it. So, we'll, yeah, just start. We'll go for five minutes. yourself stuck, just keep writing, kind of start back over. Don't let your inner sensor stop you.
Okay, go ahead and finish that thought. Next few seconds. actually probably more important than the cognitive outcome. If I actually forget my times tables and I have to think or maybe even I pull out my calculator, right, that's not so terrible. But if I feel like I can't do it, I'm not even going to pull out my calculator. I'm just going to not do anything. So that sense of being able to do something is often as or more important um, than the thing itself. Um, the other one too that he mentioned was because he knows something about mathematics when other people use mathematics to make arguments he has an ability to look at that and what I would say is it helps him discern truth or truth claims and that to me is also at the heart of what we're doing in all education is improving our ability to discern and value truth in all its forms and even artists, by the way, are seeking truth in a different way and trying to represent it in a different way than perhaps mathematics or physics or something else. Okay. I'm going to pull back the, the show pause behind the curtain a little bit. Why do we do this writing exercise? Um, there's a couple of reasons. One is, 
what we find with faculty is they got into their disciplines for a reason. But they get so immersed in it, they often lose sight of what it was that they fell in love with and why. And so this exercise helps them reconnect with what was fundamental to them at one time and be able to express it because it has become almost unexpressible. It's just too automatic. So it now helps, it is, now helps them express it to themselves and others. The other thing we found is when this is done well, it's often a revelatory experience for the people doing it. That they learn things they didn't know that they knew as they're writing. I hope that has happened to some of you. But that, I offer that to you to consider for your own classrooms. So, if we've said that the purpose of teaching is catalyzing learning, how do we catalyze learning? We're going to talk about some ideas. This is not exhaustive, but we're going to talk about some ideas. So students have, th they actually have four, and since I took one out because I was aiming for a more general audience, I'll add the fourth back in when we get there. Four concerns, if they find them present in the class, the class is good or the teacher is good. If they're absent, then it's usually a bad experience. Number one, relevance. Why does this course matter? Not to you, the teacher. I know it matters to you because you love this stuff. Why should it matter to me? How is it going to help me become the person I want to be? That's the question they're asking. Organization. There's kind of two levels to organization. One is that you get into class and you don't wander all over the place and get distracted, that you actually go through in a fairly organized way. You know where you're going. But the other is, the bigger one really is, all these things that I'm learning, how do they all fit together? How do they work together? It kind of ties in with relevance, actually. When am I going to use this stuff? How does it work in the world? How does it fit? Care for student learning. Okay, now, this is not, doesn't have to be that you're just their friend, that you're buddy buddy. You can be friends, that's fine. The question here is, do you care about my learning you care about me as a learner? Or are you just telling me what you know and at the end of the lecture you've done what you've done your job and you're going to walk out and I'm just another face in a sea of faces? Do you care about my learning? Do you think I can succeed? That's another big question here. Do you think I can succeed? Now the fourth one that I left off because it seemed more, more about just academics, right, is assessment. But we've got a lot of academics here, so I'm going to add it in. Okay? And what they ask about assessment, what they say about assessment is, is it fair? What they mean with that, when you dig a little deeper, what they mean is, are you measuring what's most important? If you tell me something is really important, then I would expect it to be measured in some way, followed up in some way. So I'm just going to be honest here. Our religion classes get a little bit of a bad rap because students go in thinking being spiritually fed, learning the doctrine, becoming a better Latter-day Saint is most important. And then oftentimes they get a multiple choice test that has lots of little details, you know, that don't seem as important as the big principle and they feel like they're you know, getting jerked around a little bit just to get a break, right? So, sorry if there are any religious educators here. It's not about you, honestly. I'm just giving you the facts that we hear from students. And by the way, that's not just religious ed. That's just one of the, you know, one of the more visible ones, but we hear it plenty of places. Okay, so 
in our workshop, we do a variety of things that help us address these issues. And the first thing we do is we write a clear, concise course of purpose. And the purpose of a course purpose, sounds a little redundant, but it does have a purpose too, is to paint a vision for your students of what they can become. Okay. Now we had a council in heaven before we came to this life. We had two plans. One of them was gonna just, they would tell us everything we needed to do and we would do it and we would be safe. The other plan painted a vision of what we could become and asked us to adopt that vision. Okay. This is what we're doing with this exercise for our students as well, is painting a vision of what they can become if they're willing to engage in this process and then let them decide eventually to adopt that vision for themselves. So we have this idea of what we want students to become. And that is beholding with an eye of faith, right? It's still not a done deal. There's still a lot of work to be done. But those things which we behold with an eye of faith and we actually work to and accomplish and see them come to fruition, we are glad. And just to point out really quick, look at what Alma is doing over and over again in these scriptures. He's having them look forward. He's having them envision what the future might be like. Oops. He's helping them create, create a picture in their minds of what their future might be like. Okay, so we are going to do the same writing exercise again. And have you think about what you want your students to become as a result of taking your course. What will they be able to do? How will they talk differently, behave differently? think differently, what kind of person will they become? So for the next five minutes, again, try and keep your pen or pencil or keyboard moving. Just let the thoughts, if, just keep it writing. Whatever you're thinking, write it. Even if it's, I don't know what else to write, write it. Something will come at the end of that problem. Okay, so for the next five minutes, let's go ahead and write on this prompt.
Okay, take a few seconds and wrap up that thought. Okay, so looking at what you just wrote, look at what, looking at what you just wrote, don't worry about writing the ideas, just look at circle, underline, whatever, some of the things that pop out to you, some of those key ideas, some of the things that came to your mind that you think this is important, I want to, so not all of it is the same. So we'll take just a minute to let you do that. underlined and try to craft that into a single statement like a good research question if you're a scientist like a good thesis statement if you're a humanist or an English <coughs> professor so let's take two minutes this is a first draft don't worry about it take two minutes See if you can compose your ideas into a single statement. The purpose of this course is blank. Okay, take a few seconds to wrap that up. Who would be willing to share? We know it's a first draft, it's okay. After your course, I put the reason I teach 
and, and this is true, is to assist others to choose good, recognize truth, and increase agency. Okay, thank you. Okay, well I'd like to invite a few more, but we're coming up to the end of the hour, so um, I'm just gonna, so we do this workshop, we have lots of other things that follow this. There are a few reasons that we have you do a course purpose, which doesn't appear in the design literature that we found at least. Number one, it helps you articulate to yourself what you are trying to accomplish, and you are then better able to articulate it to your students. Okay? And they are better able to get a vision of why all the, how all these things we're doing fit together. Okay? Number two, it gives you at this lesson, everybody pull out your purpose, and let's talk about how what we just learned today helps you accomplish your purpose. So it's now very personal. And she reports back to us that that has changed her model class dramatically. So, we are out of time. Thank you for being here. Um, anybody who wants to stick around, feel free to go to lunch, but I'm happy to entertain questions um, if people want to stick around and ask or comment.